for this evening comes from the book of Exodus, chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. This will serve as our meditation text tonight. Now a man of the house of Levi married a Levite woman, and she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. When she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him for three months. But when she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him and coated it with tar and pitch. Then she placed the child in it and put it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. Then Pharaoh's daughter went down to the Nile to bathe, and her attendants were walking along the river bank. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her slave girl to get it. She opened it and saw the baby. He was crying, and she felt sorry for him. This is one of the Hebrew babies, she said. Then his sister asked Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and get one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? Yes, go, she answered. And the girl went and got the baby's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this baby and nurse him for me, and I will pay you. So the woman took the baby and nursed him. When the child grew older, she took him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. She named him Moses, saying, I drew him out of the water. So far, the word of the Lord. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. During these midweek Advent services, we're going to be focusing on three children of the promise. Each of the children that we will be focusing on should not have lived. It took special intervention from God to protect each of these children and to make it possible for them to be alive. And each of these children were instrumental in making sure that the promise of a Savior would happen. We'll talk about Moses, Samuel, and John the Baptist. Tonight you heard about Moses. And you heard of how of how God protected him from population control. The Egypt that Moses was born into was not the same Egypt that welcomed Joseph and his brothers and his father Jacob. When they came down to escape the famine, Joseph being the second in command of all of Egypt because he had won that right by his ability to foretell the future, and prepare Egypt for seven good years and then seven lean years, and so prepared them to be the most prosperous nation in the world at that time. Because God was with him, even though his brothers had betrayed him and sold him into slavery, Joseph rose through the ranks, and he had that position of power. And so his whole family was able to come to Egypt and be protected and thrive. And grow, just as God had foretold. See, he had foretold that the people of Israel would go to Egypt and grow into a mighty nation. And then God would lead them from that nation back to the promised nation of Israel, where they would become the great people that would protect the promise, the word of God, that from the beginning had promised salvation from the sin that had infected the world. A Savior would come who would rescue them from the work of the devil, who would crush his head and free them from that slavery once and for all. Moses was a key player of that. And so God was not about to let population control stop him. Now what led up to the section we read for tonight? What led up to Moses being put into a basket by his own mother and put on a river that could have easily toppled him, drowned him, or he would have been swallowed by an alligator? Why would she do such a thing? Would you do that to your child? Let it go adrift without a paddle before it can do anything to direct its trip down that river? Would you leave it alone? Well, Moses' mother didn't feel like she had any choice. 
The Pharaoh, after Joseph was long gone, and the people of Israel and their origin story of coming to Egypt was long forgotten and disregarded, now that Pharaoh saw this great and mighty group of people, the Israelites that God had blessed, as a threat. They were big enough to sway a war if they had enemies come, if the Israelites decided to fight on the side of someone else than the Egyptians, they would destroy this mighty nation that the Egyptians were at the time. And so Pharaoh didn't like that. He was scared. He was frightened. He wanted the control of the situation. And so he told the midwives who would help the Israelite women have children to kill all the baby boys that were born. Leave the girls, but kill every boy. Well, the midwives, God bless them, feared God, and they refused. They saw these beautiful children born, and they couldn't do such a wicked thing and kill them. They were wonderful, beautiful children, whether they were Egyptian or Hebrew, and these midwives chose to fear God instead of fearing their Pharaoh. And when Pharaoh asked them, why didn't you do that? They said, well, the Israelites are, are pretty amazing. Their women are super strong. Before we even get there, they've delivered the babies without us. So what were we supposed to do? Probably a bit of a white lie. And yet they chose to protect those children at risk of their own lives. So Pharaoh had to change tactics. He had to get a little bit more direct. And so he directly commands all people, if there is a baby boy born, he needs to be killed. Instructing his soldiers, instructing all of the Egyptians, any of them had permission to kill one of these babies, and even telling the Israelites directly, you better kill your baby boys. Wow. What evil, right? What wickedness. There's a lot of times like this in history where genocide is happening, eugenics. We think of situations like the Holocaust during World War II, when many Jews were put in concentration camps and killed. Maybe you think of communist regimes that killed millions of people who refused to listen to what they said and they killed millions of them. Maybe you think of our own country that kills a million aborted babies every year. These are wicked things. It's an evil thing. Just like what Pharaoh was doing at that time when he murdered all of these children because he was afraid and he wanted control and he wanted to stop God. That's part of why I find this account of Moses so comforting. Because even when these evils are happening right, right now, and all throughout the world there is evil happening before our eyes, God still finds a way to cause good to happen even during that. Not saying that the evil is any, any less evil. That's why God needed to save this world, because it is an is a ugly place. But that God can make good happen even when it seems that evil is winning. God needed one of those babies to survive. He needed Moses to live. Because he had chosen this little baby, one of those that should have died in this massacre, to be a great leader for Israel. To help the Israelites leave Egypt and hear the Ten Commandments and be shaped into God's people, given all of these traditions and sacrifices and everything that would keep them focused on the word of God and specifically the promise of a savior that they could become a nation that would eventually give birth to the son of God, the savior of the world. I needed that nation to be that special people to protect that promise that he would keep. And Moses was the one to do it. And so it seems very random and very dangerous what Moses' mother does. She can't hide little Moses anymore. He's now three months old. He's screaming. He's crying. And if anyone is around their house or any of the neighbors and they're pressed, they will find out that she's hiding a baby. 
She'll have to give up her child and he will be killed. In distress, and I'm sure with prayer, she places her innocent baby into this little basket, papyrus basket with tar on the outside to keep the water out. She places it into the mighty Nile, which is not a little river, this big Nile, and and trusts the Lord with the fate of her child. But notice what God does. He takes this very dangerous situation and he makes it seem like it was all planned all along. Here the baby floats in the water. Just a short time later, the princess herself goes down into the Nile to bathe. She finds the basket containing a baby. She even recognizes it's a Hebrew baby. She has compassion. She loves the baby. She says, isn't this a Hebrew baby? And there's Moses' sister who comes up, should I get someone to nurse him for you? She says, yes, go. And so Moses' own mother gets to nurse her own baby until that baby is weaned and can go to live in the palace of Pharaoh, the one who attempted to destroy him and control God's people and control God. He probably showed up to the one person who would show compassion and had the power to save him. God knows what he's doing. God needed Moses to be that leader and eventually to point people to Jesus because he chose him to be and he would use him to be a part of his plan of salvation, to be a child of the promise he made in the beginning. Now, as you look at this section and as we think again about our world, I pray that as you see all these things that seem to be coincidences, all these things that are lucky, or how we would talk about it normally, are anything but that. God can use crazy situations and yet still cause his will to happen. You see this with Moses, but you see it even clearer with Jesus. Jesus being the Son of God, he knew exactly what God was planning. Even when he was fought at every turn, he was rejected by his own people. He was mocked, and he was even killed. And yet through all of that wickedness done to him and put on his shoulders, God did amazing things behind the scenes, just as he had done with Moses all those years before. Because God will not be stopped. And when God makes a promise, he will keep it, no matter what it takes. And it's not chance, it's not just happenstance, it's not random, but God orders even the wickedness of this world, the evil of man, man and his heart, to serve his purpose so that God wins every time. And God's will is done. And he does the same for you. Maybe you feel like your life is out of control. Maybe you feel like your life is surrounded by evil. Maybe you feel like the world is, as you see it around you is, is disgusting. And how could God do anything with the broken pieces of, of everything around us? Well, take to heart what happened to Moses as a baby. And throughout his life, how God shaped him and made him the perfect leader to do what was needed. Think about Jesus. Although being despised and hated, even by those who knew him, betrayed by his own followers and left, that he still accomplished exactly what God wanted done. God is doing the exact same thing in your life. Right now, nothing has changed about God. He is not any less powerful today than he was back then. But God is using good and evil to bring you closer to him. And he has a purpose for you. Just like with Moses. Now you might say like Moses, I'm not the guy and I can't speak well and I've made mistakes. But God says, I will go with you. I will do it. Stop whining and go. God not only protects you and saves you from the wickedness around you, but he gives you a purpose every day. He wants you to be here right now 
He wants you to be in the, in the place of life that you are at so that you can, through his grace, be his instrument in the world to lead other people to the promise, the promise of a Savior, the promise that Christmas is all about. You are one of his messengers, his chosen people that he has set apart from eternity to do great and mighty things despite the evil in this world that you might be a little light or a big light in this world full of darkness. That you can testify to the perfect and glorious will of God that overcomes even the greatest of evil. That's what Christmas is all about. That's where we're going. At the end of December, we'll get the pleasure of celebrating the birth of Jesus. Let us prepare our hearts to tell people about that. To remind them of that as the days get darker, not only outside, but all around. And as people get more and more frightened, that we can talk about the light of the world who came to Bethlehem, an impossible baby, born there to save us in an impossible and implausible way from all the wickedness and evil of this world and to bring us into his perfect kingdom forever. You are part of that plan that God will do because he promised to. Go with the power and the encouragement of God himself. Amen.